Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIF++ seminar. Today, Professor Ruslan Davidchak from the University of Leicester, United Kingdom, will talk about excess chemical potential and surface-free energy of a hard sphere fluid at curved walls. Over to you, Ruslan, please. Thank you very much, Vitalik. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation to allow me to give this uh, talk. So this is, uh, I would say, a culmination of about uh, 10 to 12 years of research, as you will see, um, starting from about 2010 and uh, just getting a, a last paper accepted uh, last week. So still working on the proofs. But um, so what is the general question uh, when materials um, are mixed together, one of the defining properties of how they mix is what is known as uh, solvation free energy. Essentially, if you imagine having uh, some sort of shape, some sort of particle, it could be a colloid, it could be a protein, it could be all kinds of different molecules that fit into solutions, uh, like sugar, for example, one of the defining properties uh, for putting such a particle into the solution is what is known as, as uh, free energy of solvation. And uh, if you imagine doing this, what you need to do, you need to work against um, the interaction between molecules in the solution, so these blue particles. So you have to create a sufficiently big cavity in that fluid, and that work as you know, is pressure against volume. So the first term in solvation-free energy is um, pre the pressure of the fluid times the volume of this uh, particle S. And uh, the second one is related to the surface area of that particle. And that's the work of rearranging the fluid uh, to adopt the right uh, configuration around that space. And uh, obviously, uh, pressure is something that we know quite well from the what is called equation of state. So for every fluid, you have the relationship between pressure, volume, and, and temperature. Uh, you probably are familiar with ideal gas uh, equation of state. Uh, but uh, for any other substance, there is such an um, expression. And it's uh, independent of the, of the shape. However, the, this gamma quantity, which we call surface-free energy, is something that depends on, on, on the shape. And what we would like to understand is how this uh, dependence works. So um, solvation-free energy, like you say, like I'm saying here, it's related to nucleation, stability of shape uh, of nanoparticles that are grown from solutions, protein folding, and so on. So this is something that in uh, molecular simulation and in experiments is quite important. When the particle is very large, you can imagine that this quantity, you know, every uh, wall eventually, if you look at a small scale, becomes flat. So you could try to approximate this gamma S with gamma zero, which is just the free energy of a planar surface. But that approximation is um, rather crude if you think about small particles like proteins, for example, um, or any other nano size. Uh, particles. So um, how can we characterize this quantity better? Well, uh, one of the obvious uh, connections here is to the curvature of the shape. And so when we started this investigation, like I said, uh, about 12 years ago, um, the generic goal is to understand how this surface free energy depends on curvature. And uh, then uh, we go with the simplest possible model that we know. Uh, it's hard spheres. And so hard spheres is something I did for my thesis some 25 years ago. My PhD thesis was around hard spheres. So it was nice to return back to these models because uh, one of the nice things about hard spheres is that the interaction is very simple. So the only parameter in the hard sphere model is the density or pecking fraction. So if you imagine the volume of spheres occupy certain fraction of volume, from the total volume, and that's given by this parameter eta, and it's dimensionless. So that's the only uh, parameter. Oh, I think I'm missing a cube here. So it should be 
rho sigma cube as the volume. So density times volume uh, uh, for one particle gives us uh, gives us this quantity. So um, for hard spheres, we also have an equation of state that looks similar to uh, ideal gas. You see P equals rho KBT. And uh, T enters here simply as the energy scale. So because potential energy is either zero or infinite for hard sphere interactions, uh, the, the temperature dependence is trivial. It just, so the only parameter is density. Uh, and so there is this compressibility factor, which would be one for ideal gas, and then it somehow deviates from one for hard spheres. And so we now try to uh, determine what will be the surface-free energy of the hard sphere fluid at different packing fractions uh, around a spherical or cylindrical wall uh, with radius r. Now, uh, one of the things that you I will mention later is that it provides a test for so-called morphometric or morphological thermodynamics, which actually can connects all this to a very nice theorem um, that I learned about some eight years ago from integral geometry. I didn't even know that there was such a thing as integral geometry. Uh, but anyway, so uh, talking about curvature. So this is something that you probably are familiar with. When we talk about a shape, uh, and we now talk about two-dimensional surfaces in 3D, that at every point you can def define uh, a couple of invariants, which is uh, mean curvature and Gaussian curvature, so related to um, the principal uh, radii, so the largest and the smallest radius you can, you can draw at a given point on a surface, and then either taking the average or uh, the product uh, of these uh, curvatures. Now, when we talk about uh, characterizing the whole shape, then we just integrate that over the surface and then we get something like average mean curvature and average Gaussian curvature. So these, uh, for specific cases of uh, cylinder and, and sphere, these are uh, you know, very easy to calculate quantities, uh, but even for more complicated shapes, it's, it's uh, not very difficult to, uh, to do that. Now, um, when we go back in history, obviously the dependence on this um, quantity, surface free energy on the curvature, uh, was recognized. And uh, one of the first um, such uh, characterization was in terms of Tolman length, which is just the correction to the flat uh, surface in terms of if you look at a uh, particle of radius r, then uh, Tolman introduced this length parameter delta. Um, now, a little bit later, Helfrich uh, extended, understanding that there will be other uh, components to this curvature. Uh, he proposed um, uh, to write it in the form that you can see here where uh, we have four terms. So three terms in addition to um, the flat wall, gamma zero. Uh, we have three parameters that are relating to uh, these uh, Gaussian uh, curvature and mean curvature. Um, and you can see how they uh, behave um, in terms of cylindrical and spherical wall. So what you realize, this is drawn for any shape, right? So what you realize here is that if you can calculate uh, this gamma S for spherical and for cylindrical wall, it gives you access to uh, all three parameters uh, or four parameters. So uh, one for flat wall, gamma zero, but then you have three curvature dependent parameters. And if you do these two simulations, you can get H kappa and k uh, from these simulations, and then you can apply this expression for any shape. And that's the kind of generalization that uh, we are after. If this approximation is good enough, uh, that's the question. How good is this approximation? Uh, even more general expression, you can just say, well, what if we just write this in terms of the uh, general series? Then we will have, um, you know, sort of a general form where these uh, curvatures uh, are present uh, in the expansion. And the hope is that somehow these things can be truncated or uh, converge uh, fairly quickly. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, came a little bit later, so you see uh, we have this work of Hedwiger from quite some time ago. 
But then in 2004, uh, these Koenigroth Mech uh, recognized that it actually relates to the uh, solvation free energy. So what is this theorem uh, telling us? It's a theorem that is uh, about uh, functions defined on uh, geometric sets. And in general, it's n-dimensional, but I will talk here about three dimensions because that's what we, where we live. But in general, the theorem says that if um, we have um, a function, so they call evaluation, from the, sh uh, the space of shapes to real numbers, which is continuous, additive and rigid motion invariance. So you imagine continuous is sort of uh, quite understandable. Additive in the sense that if you have uh, two sets that are uh, disjoined, then it will be the sum. If they are uh, intersecting, then you have sort of a standard uh, summation of intersecting sets where you subtract the, the, um, the intersection from the union, uh, and then you still have additivity in that uh, sense. So, uh, this theorem is very interesting because it says that if you have such general conditions, then uh, the only uh, valuations, the only functions that you will have to satisfy these conditions are linear functions of only four parameters for any shape. So volume, um, area, integrated, and mean curvature. So um, integrated curvature it means that you, you just take the mean um, curvature multiplied by area, okay? And so these four uh, parameters here, these parameters C are, uh, are independent of the shape. So you can you can uh, study these things for any shape like for cylinder and for, for sphere and then everything else will be, will be in, independent. So it is somehow uh, related a little bit to um, Helfrich's Hamiltonian, except uh, there is one more term here that, um, um, Helfrich added that in yes. Excuse me, could, could I ask a question about this very Absolutely, nice yeah. theorem? <laughs> so Hedwiger theorem, if you show the slide uh, again, um, a linear combination in terms of four uh, simple invariants. Yeah. Yes, you mentioned what with coefficients C V, C A, and so on, they are independent of a shape. Are they simple enough? Uh, do you remember well, this is what this is what we want to determine so this is what we want to determine for, for a particular system so they will be they will be uh, you will see in a moment that for hard sphere system cv will be just pressure so you will see the relationship uh if let me just go a little bit further there you go so if if we assume that this solvation free energy is such a valuation then it must have this form. So you see here, CV will be pressure. I use capital P, but anyway, this is the same pressure. CA will be gamma zero. And then we have these parameters that, that come from the curvatures. So um, H and kappa are here. So uh, in fact, uh, this would uh, postulate that the coefficient K that we had before uh, must be zero. So this k coefficient must be zero in this formulation, right? Uh, so now, um, how valid is uh, this assumption that uh, solvation-free energy satisfies? Well, it's obviously it's obviously motion invariant for the shape. Uh, it's also additive. Um, well, it's also continuous. And then the challenge is with the additivity because um, it will be additive if uh, you assume that these shapes, several shapes are far apart so that they don't influence each other in terms of fluid rearrangement. So in every fluid, as it changes its uh, structure, there is some sort of correlation length. So as long as the size of these shapes is bigger than the correlation length, then it, you can assume additivity. But uh, in general, obviously additivity will be broken. So we can consider this as a, an approximation to the actual Hedwiger theorem. And then the question is, how good is this approximation? Uh, Ruslan, yeah. uh, one more question. <clears throat> uh, this rigid motion, does it include mirror reflections? 
I, I think it probably does. I think it probably does. It definitely rotations and translations, but um, I don't see why reflections would uh, spoil. Uh, I, I must say, I, I don't remember, but I, I don't see how the reflections would spoil the um, the linearity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because the curvature, so if you, if you reflect, the, the integral curvature doesn't change for the shape. Right, so you would you would have the same. So in terms of these parameters, uh, you would have the same quantities for a mirror image of the shape. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, I think that it, the reflections could be would be included in this. But I, I, I like I said, it's just the first thing. I haven't thought about it before, so it's just my first guess. Okay, thank you, Frank. Yeah, um, yeah. So so this is now a simpler. So what this theorem tells us essentially is that. There, there might be some uh, quite simple way of uh, doing these things that are of, uh, there are some fundamental aspects for this approximation actually might be not, uh, not that bad. Um, and so given the knowledge of these H and kappa for a particular system like, uh, you know, uh, spherical or cylindrical, we can predict solvation free energy for any shape. And that's the that sort of, uh, and since that paper, there were many papers uh, that sometimes they call it also morphological thermodynamics, which have investigated to what extent uh, this is actually a useful application. Now, um, when we talk about hard spheres models uh, next to uh, a wall, there, the nice thing about hard spheres is there are many theoretical models. Uh, so they are approximate. There is nothing really exact there, but the approximations are fairly good if you compare to simulations. So scale particle theory is one such approximation. And what you will see uh, in the, if you study all these approximations, they all have the form that satisfy morphometric thermodynamics. So the deviations in, in these sort of, uh, so also density functional theory. So there is one flavor. There are many flavors of density functional theory that are applied to hard sphere models. This is one flavor, but you will always see that when it when you talk about surface free energy, there will be a a, um, a term that is a flat wall. Obviously, they look different, but uh, they are sort of to within some order. If you expand uh, around gamma to third order, something they will agree, and then the, the higher order term will disagree. But you will always have this uh, constant one over r, one over r squared for for the for the spherical surface. Um, and so it looks like theoretically the, the, the theories do satisfy uh, this morphometric uh, thermodynamic uh, concept. So um, people have started testing um, the, you know, in different calculations, they have tested for hard spheres and for other. So this is, uh, was an interesting investigation where they have taken not just spherical uh, shapes, but also other things. So even though shapes like cubes and cones have corners, you can actually define quite well the integrated curvature for them. And then it's a bit hard to see, but uh, you know the, the agreement between morphometric, which is a line, and the data from uh, density functional theories calculated on this shape agree quite well. They start disagreeing at higher densities, but at low densities, the agreement is really good. Um, but obviously, these are density functional theory, which themselves have approximations. So uh, we would like to compare to the simulations. And that's where we came and started calculating um, uh, using um, approximate um, uh, using molecular simulations to calculate these quantities. So I'm not going to go through the methodology. So um, there are several methods for how to calculate gamma, thermodynamic integration, kirkwood buff which just relates to the difference between normal and tangential pressures at the surface. The one that we adopted uh, comes from this thermodynamic relationship between the uh, differential of gamma and um, so this is excess entropy, but because temperature is um, trivial here, so uh, it's independent, um, we can scale it away. And so we just have this d gamma equal excess volume times dp. And so if we integrate it uh, from zero to a given value of p, that gives us access to gamma. So 
Calculation of this Vx is uh, not very difficult in simulations. Um, I'm not going to go into details today, but um, it is just running a simulation of hard spheres against either cylindrical or spherical wall and uh, just calculating um, this quantity based on how the density profile changes as we move away from the wall. So Z is distance from the wall, and uh, this is a bulk density, so sort of density at infinity. And then uh, the profile will have some sort of oscillations uh, as we move away from the wall, and uh, integrating these oscillations um, gives us this axis volume. Um, so that after we have done uh, these calculations, and the, the first results that we published were in 2010, and we have actually seen that at the scale of these simulations, and I'm not going to go into details here, but uh, when we have these simulations, you see we have a pecking fraction, and then we calculate the interfacial free energy for different uh, planar, planar wall and then different radii for cylindrical and spherical wall. And then we can fit these uh, lines uh, to polynomials in one over R. And then we can extract these coefficients for cylindrical and spherical wall. So if we do that, we will see um, that the agreement uh, with um, predictions is actually quite good in the sense that the coefficients that are supposed to be zero are zero up to quite high uh, pecking fraction. So one of the things I didn't mention is that as you increase the density of hard sphere fluid, it actually uh, go undergoes a, a, a phase transition and becomes solid at about um, eta equal 0 0.492. So somewhere here. So this is like a precursor to maybe crystallization. And so you see bigger deviation here, but otherwise, um, we also have this agreement between uh, the cylindrical age and the spherical age. And you see here within the error bars, um, uh, that actually is this lower line here, they agree, uh, they agree quite well. But the precision of these simulations was not so good. So, um, I mean, one of the questions that we we had: Why? Uh, where does this where does this deviation come from? And it turns out that actually things start happening um, at the flat wall. So these results here uh, at the bottom, you see uh, the other lines go straight down, maybe curving up, but the flat wall near the the freezing turns down, and that's uh, when you fit across these values to extract these uh, quadratic and cubic terms, they will deviate from zero. So a flat wall is causing problems uh, for uh, this morphometric uh, description. And we believe, although we have not, never been able to um, have a definitive understanding, but we believe that this is because there might be some pre-freezing happening. So uh, pre-freezing is something where you know, there is a, a energy cost for a fluid to rearrange itself next to a, a, a wall, so the wall fluid. And if this cost is bigger, then the cost of rearranging fluid against the crystal and then crystal against the wall, the crystal might fill in between. So even though we are working at density below freezing, and you could imagine it's, it's like a temperature above freezing, but the layer of um, solid is created because it, it's uh, beneficial uh, because of this relationship, right? So it's beneficial. It's, you get lower energy cost creating two interfaces, one with solid and one with solid and wall, than having a single uh, liquid wall interface or fluid wall interface. Um, now, at low density, uh, there is actually quite a lot of theory there, and uh, one of the approaches that in a sense of expansion is exact is so-called virial expansion. So um, virial expansions, I will just go uh, a little bit further, uh, they do give us um, expressions 
in terms of a series in powers of uh, packing fraction. And you can calculate uh, some of them, you know, the ones that are shown here, you can actually, all of these uh, coefficients are some sort of complicated integrals. And the higher power you go, the more complicated. Eventually, you're not able to calculate them analytically. So, but these are the analytical coefficients. And you do see that um, this virial expansions do predict deviations from morphometric terms. You know, see like this uh, K term or cubic term for cylinder and cubic term uh, for spherical war. They all have um, higher order dependence on eta. So, and that's why for small densities, as you remember, I mentioned before, their contributions are the small. So the deviation of these terms from zero is apparent only for sufficiently large uh, density, sufficiently large packing fractions. Um, but these are just expansions, so we don't know exactly what what happens for uh, you know uh, overall uh, for all eta here. And so we would like to verify these in the simulations, but uh, our 2012 results were not precise enough. And so what we have then done, some six years later, you see this was the next paper published, we essentially repeated the experiments using, using a bit more advanced simulation technique to get a reduction in the error uh, of a factor of about uh, 8 to 20. Um, and then this is something that allowed us indeed uh, to, for the first time, actually see a deviation from morphometric thermodynamics in the simulations. Um, so uh, the good agreement with virial expressions, as you can see in these um, in these terms um, here, the straight lines are the, the lines are the virials, and we see there is a deviation at higher uh, higher eta, but the asymptotics uh, are correct. Now, one of the things that was um, clearly demonstrated uh, a very clear deviation was for the cylindrical wall when we look at this k parameter. So remember that k parameter was supposed to be zero uh, for um, the um, morphometric thermodynamics. Then uh, from the virial expression or from the uh, density functional theory, uh, we had uh, a different curve. Um, and now for the first time, we see that the agreement, especially with this uh, block we um, density functional theory is very good uh, for our simulation. So you see, we did different, either cubic or quartic fit, fit to the data, and then we extract the coefficient. So this was the first, um, precise enough simulation to determine deviation for the cylindrical wall. If we look at the spherical wall, unfortunately, we were not, still not in, um, in a good shape to see whether there is any deviation uh, of the uh, you know, spherical term from zero. So this was the state uh, of art uh, for us in 2018. And then about uh, what was it, about 2020, yeah, just the beginning of COVID, I came across this paper of uh, David Hayes, and uh, I sort of noticed uh, an expression here, which looks again like we have four terms here, and in, in powers of sigma, which is the diameter of the sphere, it also has like cubic, quadratic, and linear term. And then immediately with uh, my longstanding collaborator, Brian Laird, we realized, well, this, what they measure here, which there is chemical potential, is essentially identical to the sylvation free energy. It's an equivalent quantity. And something that we knew, <laughs> you know, we knew for a long time, but never came across that there is actually a pra practical um, value in this. But indeed, uh, when, we, when we look at it, we'll say, well, we can actually calculate these quantities in a completely different way um, using a, a well-known method that uh, goes back to um, Widom's particle insertion. So you can see the paper here. So essentially, uh, the method um, is based on the fact that this excess chemical potential, it's called excess because it's actually a difference between the chemical potential for hard spheres and that for ideal gas. So 
So this is for a uh, chemical potential for ideal gas, and this is chemical potential for hard spheres. The difference is that, but it can be related to the probability of inserting an additional particle into a system. I will show in a moment how, how it's actually done in practice, but what um, this tells us is that, you know, this gibbs Kahn integration that we use, it's precise when the curvature of the wall is uh, small. So we work with big radius. So it's a good approximation for us uh, when R is big. This gives us better uh, method, a more precise method, uh, when the radius of, of the particle or the wall that you want to extend is actually quite small. So because it's much easier to insert something. Uh, when you try to insert it many times, uh, eventually you can sample what is this probability uh, by how many times you manage to, to get it inserted. And obviously, if you try to insert a very big particle, it very rarely happens. So the statistics is very bad. So it's, a, it's essentially a complementary method that works better for small wall radius and so we thought, uh, okay, we can we can try to do that. So uh, just to just to say what we are looking now at, um, we can just formally expand um, this in powers of sigma. So I'm sort of now uh, shifting, uh, rather than talking about a wall of radius r, I'm now talking about uh, a pal particle of diameter sigma, which actually means that sigma equals two r. So it's not, but now we think that it's a small particle that we try to insert rather than simulating next to a big, uh, big radius r. Uh, but you can have these expansions in power of sigma. And uh, if you, and you, you have analytical, so, so something here you can, you can derive, these are actually exact expansions. So these are coefficients exactly from here and from basic, uh, basic expressions uh, for the probability of insertion, um, you can derive what these coefficients should be. And the first three coefficients have been known in the literature. And what we have done very recently is give expressions for higher order coefficients as well. But what is the interesting thing? If we now compare the expansions in powers of sigma, which I wrote in the previous page, and the expansion in powers of inverse sigma, which is what we had before. So remember, I was just saying that this is 2R. So we have this expansion. This is our uh, expansion for the surface-free energy. And you can see there is these matching terms here. Uh, one series goes up to uh, larger sigma. The other goes, uh, you know, larger powers of inverse sigma. Uh, the whole function is actually should be well defined for sigma between zero and infinity. So, uh, um, yeah. And then the question is, um, to what extent a, a cubic polynomial, if we only limit to these four terms, to what extent this will uh, be a good approximation? What you realize is that cubic polynomial, so if you look at these coefficients, cubic co polynomial is indeed what morphometric thermodynamics predicts. So it predicts that all other terms either above or below here will be zero. And so if morphometric thermodynamics is correct, then we should then have matching here between pressure and C3, gamma zero and C2, gamma one, C1, and so on. Now for C0 and C1, we actually have, as I just showed, we have exact expression. And gamma zero, gamma one, and gamma two are these coefficients that we calculated um, in this 2018 paper. So if we now uh, look at the comparison of these two terms, uh, we do see deviation. So on the one hand, we have C0 expressions, and these comes from this paper of 2018. And we see uh, quite clear deviation for C1. The deviation for C0 is not so clear. So it, it is close to zero, uh, but this one does show a significant deviation. So uh, again, when we come to theoretical expressions, there are many theories. I already mentioned scale particle theory, which is this these expressions. Um, but there are other expressions. So this PY stands for Perkus-Yerich, which is one of the sort of uh, 
classical uh, uh, theory of liquid approximations um, that is used. And there are other um, relationship that um, give all of them have um, all of these uh, you know results from the literature. They all still satisfy the uh, morphometrics and thermodynamics in the sense that uh, that's all that's all you have. All higher order coefficients are zero in these theories, uh, and they all are different. And how good they are, which one is the best in terms of matching to the simulation data? Well. What uh, Hay and Santos did in their paper, they actually found a really good agreement uh, between their simulation results. And um, so exact, you know, these we have exact, you look how the simulation match and they match quite well. For C2 and C3, you have deviations and you sort of realize, okay, these, uh, these two expressions look to match the MD simulations the best. And so when we when when I read this paper, I was thinking, well, there must be a deviation there because uh, we already know from other uh, our expression that they, they cannot be um, they cannot be exact. So uh, if you just fit the, the simulation results to a cubic, yeah, they fit well, but there must be a deviation. So what we have done after that uh, in the last two three years, we have re essentially took this Widom's method and really put it on a big computer here and just crunch the numbers. So how does it work? So let, just to explain to you in a few words what we do, it's, it's actually very simple. So we have a fluid of hard spheres. Uh, so let's assume diameter is one. And then uh, we try to insert at uniformly distributed random place in this, in this simulation box. So if we put it here, then we say, well, at this point, we cannot insert a sphere of any radius. So uh, we, we did one try, and we have zero success in terms of the insertion. Now, if we, next point, we um, tend to select this point, then at this point, we can uh, insert any sphere up to uh, diameter sigma n. And so, uh, you know, we have these bins, and so for every bin, that has smaller sigma, we add one, and the others remain zero. And we keep doing it. So if we are here, we can insert more, and we keep doing it. And eventually, the probability of inserting of sphere of different um, sigmas will be just given by this ratio. The nice thing about this approach is that because it's essentially a process where you have zeros and one, it's called Bernoulli process in statistics, the variance of this process is also very easy to estimate. So there is a very nice error control. And so we have done this uh, for different eta, you see, with increments from 0 to 0.5. And we have uh, done quite a lot of insertions. So um, you know, people who understand simulations, um, I think overall, it took us maybe about six months running on average on about 100 CPUs uh, to get all these results. Um, and they were much more precise. So you can see the precision that we achieve here 10 to the minus six for obviously this is where we try to insert a bigger sphere so all the way up to diameter four for example so if the density is high then it's just not possible even with uh, 10 to the 14 tries there is there is no single insertion so there is no cavity big enough to be able to insert even once um we did check the comparison. So what you see here is the comparison between the uh, data from uh, Gibbs Khan, which is black, and from Widom. And you see indeed this complementary that Gibbs Khan didn't give us good results for small sigma and also for small densities, but Widom is the other way around. So you see there is a good agreement, completely two different methods, but there is a good agreement and they are complementary in the sense that the precision of one is better in places where the precision of the other is not so good. Um, so taking these data, we now, we take this reference expression here, which subtract from the data in order to see what's happening. So we see here, we selected this reference expression as a cubic, where the first two terms are known exactly. And then these two terms come from the, so the first two terms come from the small sigma, approximation, the, the last two terms come from the big sigma approximation, and we combine them here and um, 
if this was the expression correct, then we would get zero. This shows that there is a deviation um, and there is quite a, a clear shape here. So these dots come from gibbs Kahn integration and the line here then comes from the fit to the data. Uh, so from the WIDM, the red is from, from WIDM data here, just for one of those densities. And then we were able to find some expressions to fit these results. Um, and so I'm not going to go into uh, into details here, but the fitting expression was quite good. Um, and um, different approximations. Um, um, so the final fit, you can see here, these are deviations uh, from the experimental data of different expressions. So this is one of the best expression that you have seen before. Um, but um, we can improve. This is the reference. This is this expression. Still, there are some deviations in this region. And there is actually interesting phenomenon that we observe is that at very high packing fractions, so this is close to freezing here, we start developing these oscillations, which, are, which we cannot easily fit with, with any functional form. And again, this is the evidence that pre-freezing might be happening in this system below, below the, the freezing density. Um, now, so this was something that we uh, published quite recently, and then uh, we realized that um, there is something we can do that um, actually gives us a, a much better handle on the behavior of this insertion probability when sigma is small. So um, remember before I mentioned that from statistical mechanics, you can if you think about the expansion of this p in powers of sigma, then it's easy to calculate p at sigma equals zero. It's just one over eta. It's just the fraction of available volume if you just insert dots, right? So a dot can go either on the particle or outside the particle. And because the volume occupied by particles is eta, the free volume is one minus eta, the fraction of free volume. So, so that was easy to calculate. Now, if you try to... Uh, find what happens if you insert a particle of, of a certain diameter sig sigma, then you can insert it anywhere in the white space. And then uh, the, uh, the blue and the pink <clears throat> space is the inaccessible volume. So if you are able to estimate this inaccessible volume, then you should be able to estimate what is the remaining, the remaining accessible volume to the system. And then uh, the realization that came to us um, a couple of years ago, that this is something that is not, not very difficult to do. If, if you study you know, basic set theory and you have uh, this uh, understanding of uh, you know, the, uh, the volume of sets in terms of individual addition. So something like inclusion exclusion principle is something that is quite well known in, in the study of, of sets, of measures of sets. And, and it's quite, quite easy to understand that if you count each of the overlap with a single particle, which is this volume V1, then you will count these volumes twice. So you then have to subtract them uh, from your uh, consideration. And then if you look at these uh, and you subtract all three, then this one will be subtracted one too many times. You need to add it back. And so there is this series uh, if you look at these different volumes where the accessible volume is the, the total volume of the system V minus V1 plus V2 minus V3 and so on. And so the probability of insertion can then be written as uh, one minus plus minus plus these ratios. And these ratios can actually be, so uh, V1 is very simple. It's just the, the volume of all the spheres in the system. Uh, so this radius of these uh, spheres is uh, this sigma bar here which as I, you can see, I define in this way. So one is the radius of the blue sphere and uh, sigma is what we are inserting. Um, and so you can actually calculate um, in the simulations, you can actually calculate it using, just look at all the pairs of particles in the simulation, calculate the intersection volume. The formula for intersection of two spheres is well known. Uh, it's here and you can do this. And in general, you can write it like this. So 
the interesting thing about this is that we actually derived this expression ourselves and then I started reading the literature and I realized it it has already been all done in this paper here. <laughs> so it was a bit of a disappointment disappointment for me that I was not the first. And it, it was quite obvious that this is such a simple thing that it could not have been uh, unknown. And so indeed this was done. But the unknown part was that nobody was trying to use this approach to get access to this quantity P of sigma eta. And so, um, you so this formula comes from uh, from that you can find it in that paper but what you can now do is get access remember i told you that this was exact result this was known result this result also is known from scale particle theory which is exact but you can keep differentiating this expression at zero so the power expansion of this at sigma equals zero can give you all the additional terms so these terms were not known before, even though this expression has been written in 1959. And so we can actually um, uh, now say, okay, we have a good understanding of what's happening, but uh, even better, it turns out that if instead of using Widom insertion uh, particle method, you just use this expression, uh, at least for small sigma, um, this result is exact because what you imagine is that um, you cannot, so V, um, in order for V3 to be non-zero, sigma needs to be bigger than um, a, a particle that you can insert inside three touching spheres. If you go to V4, then it's like a tetrahedron with with four spheres, and what is the uh, smaller, the biggest sphere that can fit touching all four spheres? And that's this sigma here. So smaller than this sigma, v4, v5, v6 will be zero. And so that gives you a, a, not a series but a finite expression uh, for small sigma. And you can calculate these. So I already gave you this. The expression for this V3, so this is the volume of intersection of three spheres. Uh, it's quite a complicated formula, but it's still analytical. It's still out there in the literature. You can find it. I'm not presenting it here, but it, like, it would take like a page to present. But um, it's available. So you can actually calculate these expressions in the simulation. So these angle brackets just mean average over the simulation run. And you can see you just have triplets and, and uh, pairs of particles here uh, that you calculate distances. And these are now the results. And you see that the red error bars are our results from Widom method. And the black ones are the results from, so I'm plotting here the difference between what we got from Widom and what we got from this expression P3V. And you see that the error bars uh, on uh, the black, the P3V, is much, much smaller here, especially when we go. So, so everything it must be exact up to this line. After this line, there is now contribution from V4, V5. So obviously, we see deviations here. But up to this line. So like I said, this is just the accepted paper where we now sort of really push the precision uh, of this work. Um, quite far. So uh, just to summarize, so this was an investigation of um, how um, curvature influences the solvation free energy or surface free energy for hard sphere model. And it uh, does uh, give us a good understanding of how, to what extent can we uh, push morphometric thermodynamic uh, approximation and what is the accuracy of it for, for this model. So we combine results from different simulation technique to give us a very high precision expression for this quantity for the whole range of, of uh, values of sigma from zero to infinity. And so now we have a, a full, re we fully resolve the, uh, the expressions for deviation. There is still a, a work to do, uh, not by us, but somebody else to try to analyze this data to see uh, how these deviations match with different theoretical expressions that are out there. So theorists are working with this data now. After we published this data what about a year ago, the, the data was already downloaded over 100 times. So I assume people are 
um, working on it. So I'm, I'm expecting citations <laughs> coming uh, coming from this. Um, yes, and uh, for the future, of course, uh, what needs to now happen is uh, we want to investigate more complicated shapes um, and see to what extent uh, we are able to uh, extend morphometric thermodynamics to uh, concave shape because morphometric thermodynamics is defined for convex shapes. But concave, there are some studies there that say it's actually not not too bad. It's also working not, uh, quite well. But to what extent, uh, you know, it breaks down the assumptions of Hadwiger theorem, we don't know. And then obviously for more realistic system, when we have some long range interaction, we have some charges um, like colloidal particles and so on. Um, so that concludes my talk. So thank you very much. Just to mention uh, my collaborators, uh, Brian Laird is my actually PhD supervisor from some 20 something, 27 years ago. And then, and then Aisha is my current PhD student. Um, so as you can see generations there, which I'm quite proud of. And then computing uh, that you have seen was done on University of Leicester systems. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ruslan. Let us thank Ruslan for the nice talk. So thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, a few questions, but first uh, I'll invite uh, other people to to ask uh, the questions. Any questions for Ruslan? Okay, then uh, let me start uh, towards, uh, well, from the beginning and also towards the end of the talk, I, I noticed the connection with our uh, recent work when you talked about intersections of uh, spheres or balls. So if you go could go back a few slides when you showed the formula for, I guess, the double intersection, yes. So so could, could, could I check my understanding here? Mm. So maybe you could repeat again. So what balls? What balls do you consider? Uh, sorry, what? What? Uh... Are, are they are they completely random, or where where do you take with balls? So um, so the 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 blue spheres here yeah. are uh, the hard sphere system that is running in a simulation. I see. So, right? so they are they are mm -hmm. random in a sense that mm -hmm. uh, you can either do molecular dynamics where you you collide them and they like billiard balls and they move around, or okay. you can do uh, a Monte Carlo simulation where you displace. You try to displace. If you get overlap, you don't move it. If no overlap, you move it. And so after doing it for a while, you get equilibrium distribution. So uh, obviously the density is uniform, but then the radial distribution function will have oscillations. Uh, so the structure, the equilibrium structure of hard sphere fluid is quite well understood in a sense that it's not a uniform distribution. So uniform distribution would, uh, and also pair correlation in ideal gas. So if the, if the particles were just dots, then it would be ideal gas. And then the probability of uh, any positions would be equally likely, and the relative probability one versus the other would be also equally likely. With hard spheres, the probability uh, of, of insertion is uniform, but the, the relative probability given position of one particle, whereas another particle with respect to that, that thing oscillates because you cannot penetrate, the, they cannot overlap, but then uh, there is higher probability of them being closer together than a little bit further apart. So you can see oscillations, and this is what is called radial distribution function. And then you can go to three particle correlation, four particle correlation. So this is what's defined in, um, in these expressions here. Uh, this, this is, so if, if you think about uh, this, rho times these dr. So this is the probability of finding k particles at positions r1, rk in the volume uh, elements dr1, drk. And that that has a, um, so, so if we just talk about two particles, then it's related to this radial distribution function. So this rho, rho2 will be related to the radial, so rho2 will be uh, 
just relate on two particles, and it will have these oscillations that are well well known uh, in the radial distribution function. Um, okay, so thank you. I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So let, let me stop the recording. <clears throat>